together. For all the saints from their vigorous rest, who thee, my faith, before the world confess, thy name, O Jesus, before Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, we pray that you will bless all who, following in his steps, give themselves in the service of others, and especially these students who are about to be graduated. Thank you for calling them and for preparing them to serve in the ministry of your church. Endue them with wisdom, patience, and courage to strengthen the weak and raise up those who fall, that being inspired by your love, they may worthily minister in your name to the suffering, the friendless, the needy, and the lost. Bless all who teach and all who learn, and grant that in humility of heart we may ever look unto you 
the fountain of all wisdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. On this occasion, we bring together the program of commencement with our service of consecration. The motto of Sanford University is for God, for learning, forever. And this occasion brings together each of those aspects. Beeson Divinity School is a community of faith and learning. We're a graduate theological school, and we take seriously the academic part of our work. We're also a community of prayer and worship and spiritual formation. Today, we acknowledge again that one of these dimensions without the other is incomplete in preparing God-called persons for the service of the church. On this occasion, we acknowledge that both are essential and we commit our lives to loving the Lord our God with all of our heart and mind and soul and body and to loving Jesus Christ wherever His grace will lead, both now and forever. We're especially pleased today to have several Sanford colleagues and friends and distinguished guests helping us to graduate our students. Give me just a moment to introduce them to you. Dr. Beck Taylor became Sanford University's 19th president in July of 2021. He came to Sanford after serving 11 years as president of Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. As a scholar, Dr. Taylor has published dozens of studies in the fields of economics, public health, and child development psychology. His research has been cited in testimony given before the United States Congress, the Federal Trade Commission, and the California State Assembly. Dr. Michael Hardin is provost and professor of quantitative analysis at Sanford. He's an author, a speaker, a member of numerous professional associations, and he's an ordained Southern Baptist minister. Dr. Hardin has also served on more than a dozen professional, civic, and philanthropic boards, ranging from the Business Council of Alabama to the Alabama Symphony Orchestra. Dr. Alan Ross joined the faculty in 2002 as professor of Old Testament and Hebrew. He is a truly great scholar, and as many of us know, he's retiring at the end of this month. We are deeply grateful to God for his many years of service as a minister of a word and a teacher here at Beeson. Dr. Robert Smith, Jr. serves as professor of Christian preaching and holds the Charles T. Carter Baptist chair here at Beeson. An ordained Baptist minister, he served as pastor of the New Mission Missionary Baptist Church in Cincinnati, Ohio for 20 years. He's an award-winning author and a widely beloved preacher, but here at Beeson, he's best known as a godly, effective, truly remarkable professor and spiritual advisor. Dr. Zach Hicks is founding pastor of Church of the Cross here in Birmingham. He's a songwriter, producer, and author. His interests include the intersection of old and new in worship and the pastoral dimensions of worship leading. Sitting in the apse to my left, we're pleased to welcome our friends who currently serve on the Sanford University Board of Trustees, Mrs. Julie Collier, Mr. Vic Nickel, Mr. Steve Vineyard, and Dr. Cecilia Walker. Thank you 
for your service to Samford and for joining us on this special occasion here at the Divinity School. The Reverend Dr. Gerald Heestand, our preacher for today, and I'm almost done. He's the last one to be introduced. He's my dear friend. He's been in pastoral ministry since 1998. He serves as the senior pastor of Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park, Illinois. He's the co-founder and board chair of the Center for Pastor Theologians. He served that organization as its executive director from 2006 to 2019. Dr. Heaston holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in theology and a PhD in classics from the University of Reading. He's written and edited numerous books and articles, including The Pastor Theologian, Resurrecting an Ancient Vision. Gerald is married to his wife, Jill, and they have four children. We extend thanks to everyone who's helping us with this worship service this morning. Diane Norton, our organist, our student government leaders, chapel attendants, friends in the media center. We are grateful to you all. And we invite President Taylor now to come and offer a word of welcome. Thank you, Dean Sweeney. And I know all will join me in thanking you as well for your important leadership and faithfulness here at Beeson Divinity School. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the fall commencement ceremony of the 182nd anniversary session of Samford University and the 35th annual session of Beeson Divinity School. We are especially grateful today to welcome our graduates' family members and friends, so many of whom have traveled perhaps great distances and made many sacrifices to be here. We welcome you. We're so grateful that you've joined us. One might easily assume that today's celebratory events were set in motion nearly 182 years ago when Howard College received its charter from the state of Alabama. Or perhaps our narrative starts rather in 1988, when a transformational gift from Ralph Waldo Beeson set in motion the modern theological institution that we know today. But in reality, our foundation for today's ceremony rests deep in the heart of the founding of Christ's church more than 2,000 years ago. You see, this service is rooted in the redeeming work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit poured out on all who believe, calling across the ages to all who respond to Jesus' invitation, come, follow me. This beautiful chapel that we're in this morning reminds us that we are indeed surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We give thanks for the work and witness of all who have gone before, and we are grateful for those yet laboring here and now. For all who share the commitment to a mission, as Dean Sweeney has already talked about, that makes Sanford University and Beeson Divinity School a thriving community of Christian faith. We pray to be ever rooted and more established in the boundless love of Jesus through our acts of education, service, scholarship, ministry, and proclamation. Finally, on behalf of our trustees, our faculty, and staff, it is an honor today to recognize you, our graduating class. To you, our newest Samford and Beeson alumni, we salute you at this milestone in your journey of faith and vocation. As you receive your degrees this morning, we send you into the world to be Christ's hands and feet, ready to serve a world that needs to hear and to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please know how very proud of you we are. You carry our cherished hopes and dreams, and we love you. So may the Lord bless and keep each member of the Samford University Beeson Divinity School class of 2023. Congratulations to all of you. Will the graduates please rise? Now for the moment for which you've all been waiting. The faculty and the, of, the, of a university are the stewards of academic quality. And our faculty have specified the qualifications for each of the degrees being awarded here today. Mr. President, it is my honor 
based upon the recommendations of the faculty to present these students who have completed the requirements for the degrees listed in the program. Thank you, Dr. Hardin. By the authority vested in me by the Sanford University Board of Trustees, in harmony with the recommendations of the faculty and in accordance with the laws of the state of Alabama, I hereby confer upon you the degree that you have so rightly earned, together with our prayers, that you will use what you have gained here at Sanford, at Beeson, in the service of God and of humankind, wherever you may go in this needy world. Congratulations. In addition to receiving their degrees, each student today is gonna to be receiving a beautiful picture of Beeson Divinity School. If this is your first time here, you've recognized already uh, what a beautiful place this is, a beautiful building, a beautiful chapel this is. These pictures have the signatures of all the faculty on them. Uh, we hope and pray it'll be a wonderful keepsake for the students for many years to come. As our graduates are moving into place, we respectfully request that we hold our applause uh, until the very end, at which time I'll signal us to cheer and clap for our students. Mr. President, for the degree Master of Arts in Theological Studies, I am pleased to present Cooper Froelich. For the degree Master of Divinity, I'm pleased to present Emmanuel James Boston. Stuart Robert Clay. Joseph Ryan Collins, who's also receiving a Certificate of Anglican Studies. Jordan Lee Cummings. John Tribbett Fulweiler. Graham Brooks Gaines. Jermaine Rashawn Johnson. Davis Benton Kinchler, who's also receiving a certificate of Wesleyan Studies. Christopher Victor Lebensky, who's also receiving a certificate of Wesleyan Studies. Jessica Bristow Leslie. Alan Reed Parrish. Ava Claire Perigo, who's also receiving a mission certificate. William Jake Petty. Cody Matthew Benson Pruitt, who's also receiving a Certificate of Wesleyan Studies. Preston Allen Smith. And for the degree Doctor of Ministry, I'm pleased to present Edwin Austin Baker. All right, now is the time. Will you please join me in congratulating these students? At this point in our service, we want to move very intentionally from a time of commencement to a time of consecration of these students unto the Lord. The word consecrate means to set apart as sacred or holy, to hallow, 
or devote to a purpose that commands ultimate sacrifice or unsullied allegiance. We speak of consecrating a church or a place of worship such as this chapel, but we also speak of consecrating our own lives to Jesus Christ and of consecrating others, our children, our loved ones, and today in a special way, these dear students to the service of the Lord. From the beginning, it has been the tradition of Beeson Divinity School for the faculty to offer a blessing or prayer of consecration for each graduating student. And we'll continue this tradition after Dr. Heastan speaks. To some of you, this may look like an ordination service, but it is not. As a theological school, we have no ecclesial authority to ordain anyone. But in this holy moment, we do commit these students to the service of the church and to the work of God throughout the world. So with that in mind, we invite Dr. Hardin back to the pulpit to read to us from Holy Scripture. May I ask that you stand in reading of God's Word? First John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected in us, with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is also, we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us, if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, <clears throat> cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Make you seated. Well, good morning, all. And uh, good morning, graduates. And it's a privilege to be with you on this auspicious occasion. And so let me begin by offering my uh, sincere compliments and congratulations to a job well done. Three, maybe more uh, years of graduate education completed is no small feat. So a great uh, job to you. I think that commencements are probably similar to a wedding. I do many weddings and no one comes to a wedding to hear the wedding sermon. And I don't know that any of you have come today to this commencement to hear a commencement sermon, but with weddings, you have to do a wedding sermon and commencements, you have to do a commencement sermon. So here we are, we'll have to make the best of it. And I was praying, as I typically do, uh, prior to uh, most speaking occasions, and saying, Lord, what do you want me uh, to say to these good graduates and to the folks that are gathered here and as I prayed about it, I felt like the Lord gave me a word in particular for you all. And this is a word particular to the graduates, but the rest of you are going to be welcome to listen in as well this morning. But before I give you that word, let me ask you a question. Graduates, if you were in my place and you only had one opportunity to give a charge to a room full of divinity students, what would you say? What is the most foundational bottom line necessary aspect of the faith that ministers of the gospel need to build their, their ministry upon? What biblical text, perhaps, would you preach from? Maybe you would preach from 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. And that would not be a bad choice, because the scriptures are the very breath of God in written form. 
They are the written word that proclaims the incarnate word. Gospel ministry is not just giving avuncular advice, tidbits of Hallmark card wisdom that the pastor doles out while leaning casually upon a high top table from the stage. Gospel ministry is rooted in the truth of God revealed in the law and the prophets and the apostolic witness. And without a foundation firmly in scripture, we're, we're really just all a bunch of people making stuff up. So I base all of my admonitions as much as I can and my reproving and my correction and my training in righteousness, not simply upon my own opinion and judgments, and I commend that to you as well, because how far is it going to get me if I'm just drawing from my own wisdom? How far is that going to get you? Now, it might get you further than it gets me. I'm a fairly average person, and I don't have a lot of charisma, but perhaps you have more charisma than I do, but even with your charisma, it would only get you so far. My capacity and your capacity to exhort and admonish our congregations or those to whom God calls you to minister doesn't come from the confidence that we have in our own insight or our own charm or charisma. It comes from our conviction that we are speaking the very words of God to our congregations and to those that God has called us to minister. So perhaps there you go. If you only have one sermon to preach to divinity graduates, you should preach on the importance, the foundational reality of scripture. But that wasn't the word that the Lord gave me for you this morning. Because a minister of the gospel can be mighty in the scriptures, but deficient in love. And then where does that leave us? The truth of scripture in the hands of an unloving minister of the gospel becomes a club, becomes a cudgel. And some of you know what I'm talking about, because you've been ministered to by pastors Perhaps you've had teachers, none here, of course, who knew the truths of Scripture, who could proclaim the doctrines of the faith with crispness and clarity and insight, perhaps even boldness, but who you never would have gone to to get help for your hurts, for your fears, because they were all truth, but not much grace. So maybe instead of 2 Timothy 3.16, we should pick a text like 1 Corinthians 13.1-3. If I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have the tongue of men and angels, but have not... Well, there we go. See, I don't have the tongue of men or angels because I'm repeating myself. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have to the poor, and if I deliver my body up to be burned, or, like the Pharisee who wrote this, if I know all the scriptures inside and out, but have not love, I am nothing. And Paul knew what he was talking about when he wrote those words, because he had been raised as a Pharisee, and his scriptural learning was vast, more vast almost certainly than anything that you or I will ever possess or achieve in this life. But even with all of that Bible knowledge, he had ridden from town to town, persecuting Jesus himself. And the blood of the church's first martyr was on his hands. But then, after he met Christ, he came to see that the law wasn't about condemnation and judgment and lording it over others. But as he wrote in Galatians 5.16, the whole law is fulfilled in the single commandment. You should love your neighbor as yourself. So there you go. That's better. If we only had one sermon to preach to ministers of the gospel, we should preach about the importance of loving our neighbors as ourselves. But that's not the word that the Lord gave me for you this morning either. Because hasn't, hasn't Jesus been asked about the most important commandment in the law? And didn't he say in Matthew twenty two thirty seven? 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the great and first commandment. So maybe instead of a text about loving others, our text should be Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, because our love for God is the foundation 
upon which our love for others is built. So listen, I may not be inclined to love my neighbor as myself. Teachers, you may not be inclined to love all of your students. Students, you are heading out into ministry, to minister in congregations, and I can speak from experience that you will not be naturally inclined to love all of your congregants. But you know what? We don't love our neighbors or our students or our congregants because of our neighbors or our students or our congregants. We love others out of the overflow of our love for God. So as St. Augustine prayed in his confessions, he loves you too little who loves anything along with you that he doesn't love for your sake. And we try to love people for their own sake, independent of God. We either won't love them at all, or we will run the risk of idolatry. Loving God without, with our whole heart and mind and strength has to come before our love for others. Because it's only our love for God that legitimatizes and directs and empowers our love for others. So there it is, at last we have reached the bottom. We only have one sermon to preach to a room full of divinity students. We should preach on the importance of loving God. Because when we love God with our whole heart, we will love people as ourselves. And when we love people as ourselves, we will administer and minister the scriptures in life-giving ways so that our congregations will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. But that's not the word the Lord sent me to tell you this morning. This is the word he sent me to tell you this morning. He loves you. He loves you. Because before our love for God, and before our love for others, and before our command of the scriptures, beneath all of that, at the very foundation of the Christian life, which is the foundation of gospel ministry, is God's vast, unmeasurable, unending love for you in Christ. And if there's one thing a gospel minister needs to know in his heart of hearts, in the core of his being, it's how very much he or she is loved by God. Because everything begins and ends in the love of God. Listen, if the heart of gospel ministry is love, and it is, and if nothing we do counts for anything apart from love, and it doesn't, then where do we get the love with which we love God and others. 1 John 4.19, the Apostle John tells us that we love because he first loved us. And then Romans 5, the Apostle Paul tells us that while we were still weak and ungodly, God poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The love that animates the Christian life, that animates gospel ministry, is the love that God has poured out into our hearts. And Paul isn't saying that God's love for us is merely inspires us in our love to love him in return. He's saying that God's love for us is the very same love by which we love him in return. We have no love to give him except that he has first given love to us. And it is this love that we give back to him, God's own love. And if we let God's love for us slip into the background of our lives, we will lose the very thing that animates our ministry. So I took a sabbatical back in the spring of 2021, and as you all will no doubt recall, that 2020 was a particularly challenging year. COVID, the political divisions around the election, the race issues around George Floyd, it was a difficult time to be a pastor in 2020. And by the time I got to my, sab- my sabbatical in spring of 2021, I felt quite ready for it. And beyond all the pastoral challenges, there were a number of things going on in my immediate and extended family that were all stacking up. And I was very tired by the time we got to the spring of 2021, more tired, in fact, than I knew. And two days before I started my sabbatical, I had a severe anxiety breakdown. I'm not prone to anxiety. I wasn't before the sabbatical, and I haven't been since after the sabbatical. But I spent the first six weeks of my sabbatical in what felt like a never-ending cycle that would begin with stomach flips that would grow increasingly more intense, that would move then to the shaking 
of the limbs, and then finally climax in weeping. And it was wash, rinse, repeat for the better part of six weeks. And for those of you who maybe have had anxiety attacks, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot I could say about what precipitated all that anxiety, but I bring up my sabbatical experience, not to talk about what provoked the anxiety, but to tell you what the Lord taught me during that time. The one thing that the Lord taught me, the one thing that I relearned throughout that sabbatical was how much Jesus loved me. And I already knew that in my head, and I'm sure that all of you know it in your heads as well. But somewhere along the way, I had let the love of Christ, the love that Christ had for me, slip into the background. In over 20 years of pastoral ministry, I had become increasingly proficient in the scriptures and my capacity to communicate them. I had genuinely sought to give myself in love to others, and I had lived every day, or most days, with a conscious and earnest desire to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I was so tired. The challenges of the Christian life, the complexities of pastoral ministry, my own challenges in my personal family life had become a load that I could not lift anymore. And I was trying so hard to pour myself out in love, but I had in subtle and unconscious ways closed myself off to the love that God had for me, that he was pouring into my life. And what do any of us have to give except the love that God has first given to us? God's love isn't just a divine disposition of charity or goodwill, and it's not some external blessing stored up in heaven for us. God's love is the living person of Jesus, whom he has freely given to us by his Spirit. Love has a name, and his name is Jesus. So graduates, his love for you is not based upon the work that you will do for him, not the size of the churches that you might pastor or the ministries that you might lead, the sermons that you might preach, the books that you might write, the insights that you will bring. He doesn't love you because you love your congregations, much less because they love you. He doesn't even love you because you love him. He loves you because he sees himself in you, like a father sees himself in his child. And his love for you preceded your love for him. And it is the generative source of all that you have to offer him. And the Lord sent me here to remind you this morning, as you head out into gospel ministry, that nothing you can do will make him love you more, and nothing you can do will make him love you less. And if there's one thing that I've learned in over 20 years of pastoral ministry is that the hardest part, the hardest part of the Christian life is learning how to let God love you. And it's easy to talk about being loved by God, but letting yourself be loved by God, it means dropping your defenses, it means letting down your guard, it means giving up your self-protection and your self-justifications, it means standing naked and exposed before God. The love of God unmakes us, and it transforms us, and it compels us. And very often, the minister of God would rather do anything than let himself or herself be loved by God. We would rather preach for God, teach for God, counsel for God. We'd rather love for God, all while hiding ourselves from God's love for us. Because to be loved is to be vulnerable, And we don't want to be vulnerable. But it's only a matter of secondary importance how well you know the scriptures or how much you love others or even how much you love God. What matters above all else is that you receive the love that he has for you. Because the whole of the Christian life begins and ends in the love of Jesus. So as you begin heading out into a future of ministry, don't forget the first time Think back to it often when you encountered the love of God in Christ. Not just when you heard about the love of God. Not just when you learned about the love of God. But that first time when the veil was pulled back and you beheld the love of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
the love of God that unmakes us and upends us. Yes, it's true, it's destabilizing, but the love of God also brings such peace and such joy, an ocean of joy. And it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength, our strength for gospel ministry. So this morning, as you get ready to embark on a career of gospel ministry, I call you back, if necessary, to your first love. Not the love with which you first loved Jesus, but the unconditional, unmerited love with which he first loved you. All right, now listen, maybe this wasn't a word for everyone here this morning, because maybe some of you are already living fully and consciously in God's love. But maybe there are a few of you who need to be reminded that the entirety of your present and future ministry is built upon the foundation of God's love for you in Christ. Maybe you're here as a friend or a family member, professor or administrator. God loves you too, deeply, beyond hope or expectation. And my prayer for all of us this morning is that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. Blessings. Almighty God, everlasting Father, Holy Lord, to you belongs all praise and glory and honor. We marvel that you even think of us, let alone learn that your thoughts to each one of us are innumerable and precious. For that love, that care, that knowledge, that sovereignty, we give you thanks. We have gathered here today to acknowledge and to celebrate the graduation of these men and women. And that is fitting and right for us to do because of their faithfulness, perseverance, and diligence in doing their studies. But Lord, you warned us not to forget you. And in our successes and in our activities, not to forget that it is not by our own strength that we have done this. You, Lord, have given us the strength and the ability to do the things that we have done. It is right to enjoy the moment and the achievement, but we are warned in Scripture not to glory in our accomplishments, our wisdom, our knowledge, our understanding, but to glory in this that we know Almighty God and that He knows each one of us by name. And so, Lord, we want to praise You for the way that you have cared for and guided these students to their successful finish of this stage of their training. We know, Father, and we acknowledge that they belong to you. You formed them. You called them. You gifted them with spiritual gifts. You led them all the way through their life. And Lord, you brought them to us at Beeson, entrusting to us 
for a while their care and their development in ministry. And Lord, we know that your plans, your plans for them go beyond what we are doing here today. This is but the beginning of the way that you have treated and dealt with them. We rejoiced to receive them here into our care for instruction and development. But now, Lord, we commit them to you, praying that your saints and holy angels will carry their preparation, their training through to its fullness. Lord, I pray that they will be men and women of the word so that you may sanctify them constantly through your word. I pray also, Father, that your Holy Spirit will control their lives so that they may be empowered for the ministry that you have called them to. And I pray, Father, also that the love of Christ will constrain them in their ministry to be faithful so that in all things Christ might have the preeminence in their life. So I pray for each of you. May the Lord bless you. May he bless your families. May he bless your ministries. May he prepare to bless those to whom you are going to minister. And I also pray, Father, that he will keep you in perfect peace in a world that is apparently getting worse and worse in danger and evil and anti-Christian thought. Keep them in perfect peace, knowing that you, O oh Lord, change the times and the seasons. You raise up kings, you put down kings. And we may have confidence in your sovereign will in this world. May the Lord also give you an understanding heart that you will constantly, faithfully discern between good and evil so that you might be faithful in the way you proclaim the truth and live the truth. And may the Lord give you joy, a lifetime of joy in his service, no matter what comes, knowing that you are serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And may you be found faithful so that in the end you will hear his well done, good and faithful servant. I pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
nearly 70 years ago, my pastor, Reverend E. L. Alexander, gave this benediction. I heard it every Sunday at the conclusion of our Sunday school hour and our worship hour. He said, repeat after me, he said, with Christ, I can do all things. Without him, I can do nothing. He can bind John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing, with Paul's words in Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I know that this is technically not a benediction, but it is an appropriate invocation with benediction implications. And so I want you to repeat this after me, what Elijah Lee Alexander said 70 years ago when I was under his tutelage and his pastoring. Repeat after me. With Christ, I can do all things. Without him, I can do nothing. Amen. Amen.